Okay, let's get started. So welcome everyone to another uh, wonderful QCrypt tutorial session. So before we start, let me just remind you um, about uh, how to ask questions. So there's two places. One is in Slack. So there's a you know there's a channel for for this particular tutorial, and you can ask um, any question you like there. And I will be monitoring that. And you know if the question makes sense in context, I'll I'll ask and um, during the talk. Uh, the other method is to simply raise your hand in Zoom, and then you know I will um, ask you to unmute, un unmute yourself and uh, and ask your question. So um, so let's start. So we're very pleased to have Anne Broadbent here to give us um, a tutorial on a very interesting topic with lots of um, old and new results, and that's um, unclonability and its connections to quantum cryptography. So please go ahead, Anne. Hey, thanks a lot for the intro. It's really a pleasure to be here and thanks everybody for uh, listening in today. Um, let me start this presentation. Okay. Um, so uh, many thanks to uh, my collaborators, students, grad students, postdocs, uh, colleagues who have uh, been uh, working on these topics uh, with me and special thanks to Stacy and Sebastian for providing materials that are used in this talk today. Quantum states can't be cloned. We all know this. Um, actually, I'll formalize this theorem later, but we all know this really. Uh, it's the many papers cite the no cloning theorem as the fundamental reason why quantum key distribution is secure. Uh, so in a sense, quantum unclonability is the reason what, why we're here today. Uh, without it, there would probably not be a QCrypt uh, conference. So I'm really uh, grateful for unclonability and what it does for cryptography. Um, <clears throat> what unclonability does for us as cryptographers, it, it limits what the adversary can do. You know, it's a limitation. So it sounds like it's a disadvantage, but as a cryptographer, I see this as an advantage because really fundamentally the adversary can't copy. And if the adversary can't copy, then you can do lots of really interesting things using quantum information that you can't do using conventional information. Um, so the consequences <clears throat> are widespread, excuse me. <clears throat> we can do things like quantum money, <clears throat> quantum encodings, uh, quantum copy protected software, and these are all topics that we'll be covering uh, today. Um, for pessimists, the quantum loan coding theorem, theorem is seen as a disadvantage. And actually, historically, um, the no cloning theorem was brought up as a reason why full scale quantum computers could never be built. That's because, you know, you can't copy and therefore the conventional wisdom that uh, copying is required in order to do error correcting codes uh, was, was voided. And therefore people were saying, you know, we'll never be able to do error correcting codes. But that, that turned out to be not true. And really it's the, thanks to the ingenuity of the um, quantum information scientists, we found quantum error correcting codes that don't require copying. We, and even fault tolerant quantum computing is now a reality. Um, so uh, that's kind of a theme that happens over and over again. There's some classical way of thinking that seems not to be directly applicable to the quantum case, uh, but then thanks to some hard work, we're able to um, go around those obstacles. And uh, in cryptography, that's also present in uh, things like quantum rewinding, which is an element of zero knowledge proofs, as well as quantum oracle queries. So we're also gonna talk about a little bit about those ones today. Um, in recent years, there's really an increase in uh, this topic of unclonability, and I refer to you to uh, Aronson, Scott Aronson's 2016 QCrypt after dinner speech, where uh, the main topic was really unclonability, no cloning theorem, and what we can maybe do with it. So that, those were some early ideas, uh, but really there's some fundamental que questions that remain. Uh, so I have to admit that as far as I know, uh, we don't really have an answer to the question of what is unclonability. Um, we kind of, it's one of those things that you, uh, you can say, well, I know it when I see it, um, uh, but um, there's no formal definition of, of precisely what it is. So we're going to kind of have to go with the flow today and continue in that idea of um, embodiments, talking about embodiments of unclonability, but without necessarily being able to formalize uh, what the fundamental concept is. Um, 
the other fundamental question, unfortunately, to which I don't really have a, a, a solution, but this is a little bit of a joke, is I'm not sure if it's unclonability with an EA or just unclonability. And as a Canadian, I, I kind of err, err towards the side of putting more letters in a word if need be. So I've been using unclonability uh, EA, but um, I did a Google search last night and I think I've, I am definitely outnumbered. And it seems like unclonability with an A is um, way more common. So I think I'm going to go back and forth today. Oh, and then I wanted to tell you about the physical analogy uh, for quantum information, which I think is really useful when you're talking about unclonability. And that is, to me, quantum information is much more like a physical object. Okay, we know, we know, we know the saying, you know, information is physical, blah, blah, blah. But I really mean that if you're trying to think about crypto applications, it's useful to think that quantum information is an apple. Um, it, it has physical properties that we can actually emulate uh, using uh, cryptographic protocols that we cannot emulate using conventional information. So um, an apple um, is something that you can taste, but when you take a bite, that changes the apple. It leaves a mark, and namely that mark can be detected. Um, the apple can be shared but there's only one apple to share. So if I keep half, I can share the other half of Gorion, but that's it. We can't have more than a full apple if we combine our shares together. And of course the apple can itself cannot be copied. And all of this contrasts with conventional information, classical information. Uh, this picture means like the, the, the video stream arriving to you right now. Um, the conventional information, it can be observed without changing it. You can share and copy classical information, of course. Um, so, so yeah, in cryptography, uh, we're trying to, to emulate these properties of the apple, and you'll see this coming up uh, later. Um, so it's a useful analogy, I think. I wanted to first talk about these annoyances that I alluded to, the annoyances of quantum and clonability. And uh, this is more of a survey. I don't want to go over these uh, in much detail. Um, kind of get them out of the way first, and then we'll talk about the benefits. So um, th th there's, a, there's a very common technique in conventional cryptography, which is to keep a transcript of the interaction. So here we have a, like an interactive process, Alice and Bob, and they have messages going back and forth. And uh, a transcript means to keep uh, a string which records everything that has uh, been communicated over the channel. So the input, and everything on these on these lines of communication and the output. And uh, classically, of course, we can keep a copy of all of these and we can analyze them, uh, et cetera. But uh, quantumly, this completely breaks down uh, because it's not possible in general to simultaneously have the input um, as well as what's going on on the first wire, what's going on on the second wire, um, et cetera. Uh, that's because maybe the input only existed in a single copy. So um, having a transcript would, would boil down to having copies and that's not possible. So um, this has brought many challenges to uh, quantum cryptography and um, namely in, uh, in the, one of the early applications of quantum cryptography was a zero knowledge. Um, and in zero knowledge, a common technique is called rewinding. In, in rewinding, basically what you do is that you, you're not too sure if you're going in the right direction, so you continue. And then if you realize at some point that you made a mistake, you go back to prior point of the execution of the protocol. And if you have a transcript, that's easy. You simply reset everybody's memory and you go back to that point in time. Um, and the idea, because of this trans transcript problem and also because measurements possibly uh, disturb um, the rewinding process, um, it's not possible to, to apply these uh, conventional techniques uh, in the case that the communication channels are quantum. And then the, this was resolved, um, at least uh, to some extent, by a uh, Watchers in 2009, who proposed a quantum rewinding technique. And the consequence was to show um, that these uh, classical proofs were also secure against quantum uh, protocols. And I would like to refer to you, you to a uh, really nice um, tutorial talk that was given at QCrypt 2019 by Fang Song. And uh, he goes into all the intricacies of zero knowledge proofs in a quantum world. Um, you can find his uh, slides for that talk on his personal website. 
And this is a topic of uh, current interest. Um, in, in this tutorial, I'll be telling you about uh, results that we have presented uh, this week at QCrypt. Uh, the color code is that if they're black, they, they've, they've happened in the past, so you can watch the video. If they're green, they're happening uh, basically tomorrow. So we still have lots of um, research going on on uh, zero knowledge in the quantum world. Another topic where uh, we uh, run into a situation of a difficulty related to the no cloning and quantum information is um, in what's called the quantum random oracle model. The random oracle model is a methodology in cryptography. It, uh, it's an idealized hash function. It's a, basically, it's a proof technique. It's like, well, if you're having trouble with your proof, you can, you can add this random oracle in your protocol. And sometimes the proof comes out more, more neatly. And sometimes that enables a proof, whereas you may not be, have, be able to have a proof otherwise. So um, a random oracle is model, it's, it's a black box, and it models a purely uniform function f. And this black box can be called during the execution of the protocol. So for instance, here's a quantum protocol with uh, party Alice, and Alice is making uh, oracle calls to this random oracle. There's something called the recording barrier. Similar to the case of the transcript here, it's not possible in general to record quantum oracle queries. So that means that it's not possible to uh, take a tra take take a um, take a snapshot at each of these record each of these input states to the random oracle, and then later you know analyze them to do something about about these oracle calls. So there have been techniques that were developed to. Um, to nevertheless uh, get some, some of the, the power of this um, recording techniques and it's nevertheless applicable to the quantum random oracle model. And one of them that I wanted to highlight is um, also at QCrypt 2019, um, uh, Mark Zandri gave a tutorial, a, no, an invited talk on quantum techniques in post-quantum crypto. And that's also the year of um, one of the techniques uh, that Mark Zandri authored on, on um, it's called the compressed oracle technique, and that paper was called "How to Record How to Record Quantum Queries." Uh, it's a bit of a surprising title, and it's a surprising technique to kind of overcome this recording barrier. And uh, once more, uh, we did have a talk this week on this compressed oracle technique. So uh, even a few years later, this is still uh, very relevant to quantum and post-quantum cryptography. Okay, so that, that was the overview of the, of the challenges. And now I wanted to go to the advantages of quantum unclonability, uh, because there are of course many. Um, okay, all of quantum key distribution. You know, informally, this is always, this is always uh, referred to, we always say, you know, oh, because of no cloning, it's not possible for the eavesdropper to keep a copy of the communication channel and therefore she can be detected, blah, 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 blah. That, that's like the informal uh, reason why quantum key distribution is secure. So really um, it's thanks to no cloning that uh, we have um, the vast majority of the talks here this week um, based on QKD and therefore based on no cloning. Interestingly enough, I wanted to mention, you know, uh, there's this no cloning theorem that I'll show you uh, shortly, uh, but we never actually use that theorem to prove security of protocols. Uh, so just to clarify, it, it's, a, it's an intuition that uh, these protocols should be secure because of no cloning. You know, if no cloning was false, then the protocols would, we, would probably not be secure. But to go to the full proofs, we have much more sophisticated techniques. And of course, I referred to you to um, all of the great talks um, that we've had uh, this week and in prior QCrypts. And uh, here are some other talks. Um, fortunately, they're all uh, they're all in green, so you can all watch these uh, tomorrow, I believe. Um, there's some uh, other talks that are uh, kind of beyond QKD, but they still have this unclonability flavor. So things like uh, practical quantum tokens, uh, which is related to quantum money, uh, hidden cosets and applications to unclonable cryptography, uh, position-based cryptography. Also used, also based on no, no cloning theorem, and uh, quantum encryption of certified deletion, revisited public key, attribute based, and classical communication. So we're going to talk about um, all of these three, except I'm not going to cover position based cryptography today. 
um, but it's also a very interesting topic, of course. Okay, to get to uh, to this unclonability, um, let's let's look at historically what happened, and uh, this is. Um, uh, one of my really favorite papers, each time I read it, there's I find a tidbit that I hadn't noticed before, like a little gem. And uh, maybe sometimes a gem in the rough, but it's a gem nevertheless. And um, you can hardly blame uh, the author. This is written in 1968. This, is, this was before the word qubit existed. This was before the no cloning theorem. It was a very, very early paper on quantum information. And... Um, it's even on quantum cryptography. And um, it took many years to be published. It was published in the wake of the uh, QKD, BBD4 QKD protocol, of course. So um, what Steven Wiesner uh, suggested, the paper is called Conjugate Coding. And uh, he was saying that the uncertainty principle imposes restrictions on the capacity of certain types of communication channels. This paper will show that in compensation for this quantum noise, quantum mechanics allows us novel forms of coding without analog in communication channels adequately described by classical physics. So it's this coding that I'm really interested in and that we're going to be um, referring to uh, many times, uh, I'll call it of course, conjugate coding. And um, I thought it would be appropriate to mention uh, that Steven Wiesner uh, passed away last week. Uh, it was saddened to hear and um, many scientists, including uh, Scott Aronson in his blog have um, written, uh, um, their, their memories of their attractions of Steven Wiesner and we're of course super grateful for his contribution. Wiesner's conjugate coding um, will pick a basis uh, theta, which is a bit, and we'll pick uh, also a bit B and we'll use this notation B sub theta um, is um, either uh, the bit B encoded in the computational basis or the bit B encoded in the diagonal basis. And the intuition for Wiesner's conjugate coding is that if you have a single copy of B sub theta where B and theta are unknown and you're like the recipient of this state, um, oh, sorry, the other way around. So suppose that there's a single copy of B sub theta, first of all, uh, if you're the originator of the state, namely, you know, B and theta, it's easy to verify B sub theta, namely, you would measure B sub theta in the theta basis, and you would expect to see the bit B. If you don't see the bit B, then you could reject. But the intuition is that if we have no knowledge of the encoding basis, then no, 30, no third party could create two quantum state this, that pass this verification with high probability. Right, so suppose you don't know the basis theta and you have a single copy of this, then it's not possible in general to create two copies, both of which that would be accepted with high probability. Uh, for some notation, uh, we'll have these bit strings. Uh, you know, so far these were bits, but you know, if you have theta being a, a bit string of n bits and b being a bit string of b bits, then we can have. Um, n conjugate coding states being this tensor product. And we'll also call that B sub theta. Wiesner had envisaged a quantum banknote, which would be um, for a random B and a random theta being n bit strings, it would simply be that sequence of conjugate coding. And this can be depicted uh, visually here. Here we would imagine that um, the uh, encodings are in photon degrees of freedom, and they're, they're stored somehow. Okay, Wiesner knew already of the challenge of storing quantum information, and this is still a challenge today. So I don't recommend investing into quantum money just right now, since, it, since probably your investment will uh, decohere very quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, so we would store these qubits, and this could be uh, measured by the bank and verified by the bank, who, who is the originator of this quantum system. But uh, we could limit the capacity of an adversary who does not know B or theta to, uh, to counterfeit this quantum um, money. Um, of course, uh, the history is that Conjugate coding was the original idea that led to BB84 quantum key distribution. And I just want to go on a little tangent to show you maybe the simplest possible, or maybe the simplest um, uh, demonstration that you've ever seen of BB84 quantum key distribution. Uh, it's just going to take uh, 30 seconds. 
uh, because this is not the topic of this talk, but I couldn't, I couldn't resist. So um, BB4 quantum key distribution, Alice generates a random key, encodes it in an apple, sends the apple to Bob. And then Bob verifies that the apple is intact. If the apple is intact, he gets the key that's inside. And if there's an adversary on the line, well, if they try to modify the apple in order to read the key, they will be detected because that will um, un, um, unmistakably, it will modify the apple and Bob can notice that and he can reject the key. Oh yes, and of course, uh, the assumption here is trusted apples. Uh, and this is a, um, a reference to uh, what's happened in the past uh, 10 to 15 years, I don't know, on uh, device independent quantum key distribution. So trusted apples is the conventional key distribution and untrusted apples, if we don't know precisely how they're prepared, et cetera, that would be the realm of device independence. Okay, going back to Wiesner's uh, security argument. That's it for QKD for today. Mm. Okay, so I find this kind of fun to look at because um, this, this is the argument, of course, you know, written in 1968, so I'm totally fine with this, but um, the, the argument is all about duplication. Like, could there be some way of duplicating the money without learning the sequence? No, because if one can copy, then many copies can be made by making copies of copies. So it's all about like this, this intuition that he had that copies are impossible quantumly. Um, the, the, the formalization of the no cloning theorem uh, mostly is cited uh, by, to, to be uh, Wooters and Zurich, but it was also simultaneously proposed by Deeks. And if you go back in the literature, actually Park also had a version of this uh, way earlier in 1970. And um, this is the exact case, the simplest case, you know, two qubit unitary. It says no two qubit unitary exists such that for all single qubit states psi, if you take, if you apply the unitary, you take psi with some auxiliary space, and then you ask to get two perfect copies. And the proof, um, I can go through this proof, and uh, which is it's a nice uh, linear algebra exercise. Um, it's a con proof by contradiction, and it uses the uh, linearity of quantum mechanics. Um, and I kind of like to present this, like you know, high school students almost or first year undergrads um, usually have the have the baggage to be able to understand this. this this version of the no cloning theorem, there are of course approximate versions, et cetera, but I'm not uh, gonna go into that uh, right now. Um, so that's, I just wanted to flash that, that uh, no cloning theorem since we're that's what we're talking about. Um, getting back to this question of what is unclonability, I told you, unfortunately, we don't have a full answer to that. But when we um, try to, to observe or like talk about this embodiments of unclonability, it could be useful to relate to um, other work, namely in the area of security and cryptography. And uh, cryptography has, um, conventional cryptography has a 20 to 30 year head start. And they've been asking these questions for a long time, of course. Um, one of the best answers that came out, and really this had a huge influence on the entire area, is uh, around 1984. I mean, I think this is the journal version, so a few years prior to that, uh, Goldwasser and McCallie, uh, they talked about probabilistic encryption. And really the moral of this, of this work is that security for an encryption scheme can be defined in terms of a game. That means that you should describe um, precisely the parameters of the game, describe some parties, uh, this, and uh, formalize the security in terms of the maximum winning probability of any adversary, quantified over all adversaries, at this game that you're trying to show. And the, the, the game can be different based on what properties you're trying to show for the encryption scheme. You know, chosen ciphertext attacks, play, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, um, that's, the, that's the point of view we're going to also use for unclonability. So we're gonna have a certain type of game, depending on the type of unclonability we're trying to establish, we'll have a game and then we'll bound the probability of the adversary at winning at that game. So the reason I bring this up is that we were talking about Wiesner's quantum money. We had this uh, informal argument of security by Wiesner 
And now in terms of a game, we could formalize what we're looking for. So we have a quantum banknote. We have a, an attack. Um, this could be seen as a pirate or somebody who's trying to counterfeit the quantum banknote. And then the attack creates two quantum systems. These are a different color because they might not be exactly what the original one was, but there's some uh, pirated versions of the uh, quantum money. And then we have a verification procedure, which is to verify in the known basis. And we'll say that the scheme is secure if we can bound this probability of winning at this game, namely of making both verifiers accept. This would, this, this would correspond to taking one quantum banknote and then attacking it and then creating two banknotes that are both accepted, which would actually have created, you know, doubled your money. And so we would like to bound that probability of doubling the money. And um, I will want to relate this to um, quantum cloning. <laughs> so when I was a grad student, I, I just, I didn't get it. So there was this no cloning theorem. So I knew that no cloning was impossible. And then I go to these talks and everybody was talking about quantum cloning. I didn't get it. Like, why are you talking about quantum cloning? It's not possible. So these are actually approximate cloners or optimal cloners. So how close can you get to cloning without actually cloning? Because that's impossible. But what's the best you can do um, given the constraints of quantum mechanics? So this situation is a type of cloning question. Like how well could you clone, knowing that it comes from the quantum state comes from a certain distribution, how well can you clone it? And um, there are results on, um, and I would like to refer you to the survey on universal quantum cloners, which are cloners that are optimized for any possible input state. Um, I would like to note that here it's not the best cloner here is that would not necessarily be the universal one because we have this uh, special guarantee on the way that the quantum systems are prepared. So although it's a similar problem, this problem, the specific problem for security of Stephen uh, Wiesner's quantum money had, had not been solved. So uh, the answer is three quarters to the end and it took until 2012, uh, Molino, uh, Vidic and Watrous showed uh, the optimal counterfeiting attack uh, using techniques from semi-definite programming. So that that's for the that's for the original uh, Wiesner quantum money, and I wanted to mention that uh, around 2012, well, actually at the same time as this um, optimal attacks were uh, developed in the previous slide, we had a type of quantum money revival, which is still still ongoing. Um, so, um, related questions that are uh, very relevant, uh, things like uh, noise tolerance, uh, quantum money, so feasible of current technology, um, and then a quantum money with classical verification, and a topic that is still of current research is public. Key, what's called public key quantum money. Uh, in other words, it, this quantum money can be verified by any user. So this is useful because um, so far the quantum money of Steven Wiesner could only be verified by the bank. So that's useful if like one of the applications was subway tokens, which makes sense. Like uh, the subway token originator is the only person who's also gonna be able to verify the subway tokens. But usually for money, we want it to circulate widely and we want um, many users to be able to verify it. So um, that's uh, what's been solved in these works but I'm not going to go into details uh, today. Quantum money, it's like a, it's like a token of, that you can verify. It verifies the authenticity of the physical object. But that object doesn't contain any information, right? So it, it's, a, it's like checking that your subway token is valid, but it doesn't check that any um, information, underlying information is, is correct or is um, unique, et cetera. So um, I'd like to kind of propose this, this hierarchy of information. There's this unclonable tokens, which is just the authenticity of the information, of just authenticity, sorry. And then at, at a higher level up, we'd have information. So um, the question is, can we make information unclonable? So that's why there's these envelopes here. So we have a quantum encoding of some information, and then we want to use the no cloning principle to prevent um, that information to be duplicated. 
And we'll, we will look at uh, three embodiments of this. Actually, we'll focus mostly on the first two and then briefly mention the third one. We'll look at certified deletion, unclonable encryption, and unclonable decryption. The physical analogies go a long way here. So I want to start with certified deletion because, because it really has a nice physical analogy. I think it's easier, it's easier to grasp. So certified deletion is a type of, um, we're hoping a physical type of encryption where Alice takes a message, she inserts it into a safe and closes it and sends that safe to Bob. When Bob gets the safe, he has a choice. He, can, he could return the safe, the closed safe, uh, to Alice. Um, and he does that before Alice ever reveals the combination. So when Alice gets the closed safe, she'll be convinced that Bob never opened it and she, he never, therefore he never read the message. Or he could keep the safe and when the combination is available, he could open and read the contents. Okay, so a couple of specifications here. Um, why am I talking about the combination being available? So in this setup, uh, for some reason, Alice will eventually broadcast the combination. This could be on purpose, or it could be because of some eventual leakage, namely because maybe um, the key is uh, only computationally secure and eventually somebody manages to break it, break it, or for some other physical reason. But that's kind of outside the scope of our work. We'll just imagine that eventually the key is going to be leaked. And the other thing I want to mention is that this is an XOR. So I really mean this, uh, <laughs> it's like when you go to the restaurant, you know, they say soup or salad, they mean soup X or salad, like one or X or the other, not both. Um, and so Bob, he can do the first one, X or the second one, but not both. And the question is, can we achieve this in a digital world? Can we have this physical setup and could digital information um, achieve this? Uh, if the information is conventional, uh, the, i.e. classical information, the, proof, the answer is resounding no, and it's easy to see that this would not be possible. So if the encoding is a classical message, Bob can make two copies. And he can use copy number one to convince Alice that he did not read the message. It's a proof by contradiction. So suppose it's this, such a scheme existed. He copies it, uses the first one to convince Alice that he did not read the message. And he can use the second one and wait till the key is revealed, use the key K to decode. So uh, clearly this is not possible uh, classically. Um, I want to talk about a possible application of certified deletion. Um, what Alice does is she can use certified deletion to store her will with a lawyer. So this is her last will and testament. And uh, it's encrypted. She Maybe she'll even secret share the key with her executors um, so that when she passes away, somebody could actually read it. But the point is that um, suppose she wants to update her will. Well, there's sensitive information in this will. You know, Maybe she doesn't want this initial version to ever be known. So she could uh, first ask the lawyer to prove deletion and then, um, and then store a new version of the will. So that will make sure that nobody will ever know what was in the first will, supposing, assuming that, of course, she didn't, she didn't pass away in the meantime. OK, so going back to uh, this uh, quantum encryption, if we're talking about it with certified deletion, if we're talking about it, it's because there's a quantum solution, right? So the quantum mechanics is going to enable the best of the physical and digital worlds. Uh, it's going to enable to encode a classical message into a quantum state. And Bob will be able to prove that he deleted the message by sending Alice a classical string. The basic idea here, uh, we use conjugate coding. We use a random basis, a theta. Here, the, this is an example with four uh, qubits. So suppose the random choice is 0, 1, 0, 1. And then we uh, encode a random bit r. Oh, previously, this was called b. Um, so suppose we encode the, this, these, these bit, bit strings 0, 1, 1, 0, and then we give the Wiesner encoding or conjugate coding of that uh, string, r sub theta. And then we have two substrings of interest. There's r comp, which is the substring of r where the qubits are encoded in the computational basis. So here it's uh, 0, 1, 
because here we have zero, here we have zero, and we have our diag, which is the substring of R where the qubits are encoded in the diagonal basis. And it's this one here, one zero. To encrypt the message, we're going to use the R comp substring. So say this is a two bit message, we'll send the entire conjugate coding state as well as the message XOR R comp. To delete the message, the um, recipient should measure all qubits in the diagonal basis. So uh, that means that if we were to measure all these qubits in the diagonal basis, we are certain of the measurement outcomes uh, for the qubits encoded in the diagonal basis, namely the one and the zero. That's why I have stars here. These represent random bits. So the star could be zero, one randomly because that qubit was in the computational basis and same thing for the third qubit. And to verify the deletion, uh, well, this is the classical string Y that's returned. Uh, the, the, the originator should simply verify that the one and the zero here are intact. To decrypt, uh, once, once you know the key K, theta, uh, the key theta, sorry, <clears throat> you should measure the qubits in the position where theta is zero, and then you'll get the substring R comp. And then we can use this information about MX or R comp, R comp to simply decrypt. So um, this is the basic scheme. It doesn't have full security, but it already intuitively, uh, it has some level of security. The uh, intuition is that as the probability of predicting R diag increases, i.e. the adversary produces a convincing proof of deletion, well, it must mean that somehow the information in the computational basis is lost, it's erased. Because you know having high, high information about the, the state of this plus and minus means that somehow you should have low, because of the random choice, et cetera, means that you should have a low information about R comp. And this is embodied in um, some of these famous um, uncertainty relations, <clears throat> for instance, the one by Mass and, and Ufink here. Uh, we talked about defining unclonability in terms of a security game. Uh, here, here's the security game for certified deletion. What we would do is that we have an adversary. The adversary creates a message. And uh, the message um, is sent to a, an encryptor. The encryptor uh, creates a key and then chooses a random bit B. This random bit B is very important. If B is zero, the encryptor is going to encrypt the message zero. If B is one, the encryptor is going to encrypt the actual message that the adversary sent. So then uh, she applies certified deletion, and this is the encrypted message. The adversary gets it. And then the adversary produces Y. Y is this candidate proof of deletion. Uh, the uh, encryptor verifies this Y, and she will accept if and only if Y is consistent with this R diag, you know, looking at the positions where theta was equal to one. And then the originator, the adversary gets the theta. This is the key and tries to predict the bit, a bit B prime. And the adversary will win if B prime is equal to B. So if, if the adversary has, and, and sorry, and the originator has accepted. So what the adversary is trying to do is trying to convince the originator of the deletion. And at the same time, being able to know the bit B where the bit B was, whether it was the original message that was encrypted or the uh, bogus message zero. And we'll say that we have the certified deletion prob property if the probability of winning is bounded by a half plus a negligible function in lambda, where lambda is some security parameter. Right, because they can always win a probability half by guessing randomly, and then we really want to have this negligible advantage. Um, the outline of the proof uses um, a very common technique in quantum key distribution, which is to look at the, um, the, the entanglement based game. So the first game that I mentioned is the prepare and measure scenario where it's the actual protocol, but then we look at some related protocol where um, the adversary creates this entangled system rho ABE. A is a system sent to the originator who will measure and to get the string R. B is going to be measured in order to get the uh, candidate proof of deletion, Y. And then um, E is the adversary held by the, the, uh, the register held by the adversary. And um, 
So it's it's a kind of a change of the order of operations, but bounding the probability of winning this game will also bound the probability of winning the original game. And then we're going to apply some entropic uncertainty relations, which are the same ones which are used in the proof of security of QKD. <clears throat> because this, this, this E system is similar to the QKD scenario where we're trying to show that the E is independent of the, of the key that is eventually established in QKD. So um, uh, really what happens is that similar to QKD, we give an upper bound on the max entropy uh, based on the acceptance probability of this um, proof of deletion. And that gives you a lower bound on the min entropy and shows you that Eve has low information on uh, the, uh, the message. Um, so far, we talked about the uh, simple protocol um, of course, uh, if we use privacy amplification, same thing as in, as in QKD, that enables us to reduce and make uniform the advantage of the adversary. And also this protocol inherits the noise tolerance that was also uh, given by these QKD security proofs. So um, we're able to, um, to incorporate that into the protocol, namely um, the uh, originator will accept Y, the proof of deletion, if less than K delta bits are wrong. And then we can use error correction to uh, make up for that. So certified deletion, um, there was some follow-up work by Kundu and Tan. And also at this week's QCrypt, uh, you can see quantum encryption of certified deletion, revisited, public key, attribute-based, and classical communication. So stay tuned uh, for those talks and more uh, updates on certified deletion. Um, I want to show you another example of unclonable information. This one is unclonable encryption. Um, think about, for now, a classical encryption scheme. So Alice has a message, encryption key K, she sends the encryption to some adversary. Then it's always possible for the adversary to create two copies of that ciphertext. And suppose, similar as in the case of certified deletion, suppose that eventually the key is leaked. Then each adversary has a copy and each adversary can decrypt, so assuming that this is a correct encryption scheme. Okay, so what we have here is that the message M appears twice now, both adversaries have it by virtue of the fact that this uh, adversary in the middle um, simply copied the ciphertext. But what if, um, okay, yeah, so this is the observation. Classical ciphertext can be copied. Now the no cloning theorem tells us that this thing that's happening in the middle uh, could be could be uh, prevented using quantum encodings. So that's what we're going to do uh, with unclonable encryption. We're going to use a quantum encoding for the classical message. So encryption is going to create a quantum state, and then we're going to uh, limit the uh, possibility of the adversaries to both be able to predict M. Um, and that's so that's the figure of merit. Uh, this is different from quantum cloning. So I remember that survey I talked to you about um, previously. Uh, here, um, here it's an adversarial situation where we want to extract the message M. So we have no, we need to quantify over all possible operations of the adversaries here. The optimal security would be for a random message would be one over two to the N uh, because the adversaries could do a coordinated guess. And um, in some work with uh, Sebastian Lord, uh, we showed that a quantum encoding in the quantum random oracle model uh, that would lead to the optimal, to the, to the probability of, of winning uh, of nine times one over two the n plus some negligible function in some security parameter. Uh, at this week's QCrypt, there is a poster on uh, limitations of unclonable encryption and simultaneous one way to hiding uh, that, uh, amongst other things, shows that uh, this bound here could, could maybe be tightened, but not below 9 eighths. Why would you want to use unclonable encryption? Here's one application. Um, Alice could use unclonable encryption to distribute an encrypted movie ahead of the movie release date. So she wants the uh, movie theaters to, to be ready uh, for the release date. So she sends ahead of time the, um, the, the encrypted movie. And the day of the release, she reveals the key. And thanks to the unclonable encryption, she's sure that at most one recipient can decrypt the movie. 
So that's kind of assuming the, the strict communication model, you know, after the key is revealed, there's nothing we can do to prevent a copy because it becomes classical. But when, when it's still quantum, we can inherently prevent from copying of the message. Um, here is a, a basic protocol, similar to a certified deletion. Uh, let's start simple. So you encrypt a message M into a conjugate coding encryption for random basis theta and a random bit string M. So that's your ciphertext. And the key is theta and B. So it's easy to decrypt. If you know theta and B, you can um, use uh, an XOR to compute the original message M. In terms of security, what we're gonna ask is, okay, here's the security game at the same time as the actual scheme. Uh, the um, adversary tries to kind of pirate this um, ciphertext, the key is then revealed. And then the question is how well can Bob and Charlie simultaneously guess the message M? And once more, we'll look at the entanglement based version of this game. So here, instead, we have the adversary create this uh, tripartite state, row ABC, sends the A register to Alice, uh, B to Bob, and C to Charlie. Um, Alice measures the qubit in a random basis to obtain the bit string B, and then theta is revealed. And the question is, how well can Bob and Charlie simultaneously guess B? Well, fortunately, uh, this setting is exactly the one that's considered in this um, paper, uh, a monogamy entanglement game with applications to device independent quantum cryptography by Tawami Michel, Fair, Kinuski, and Vayner. So um, they have a bound of the optimal winning probability is a half plus one over two square root two to the n. And the idea for our unclinable encryption is it will amplify this using uh, the quantum random oracle, uh, such as the oracle that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. So um, the QROM maps an, a lambda bit string to an n bit string. And we will um, create a conjugate coding state and then uh, kind of force the adversary to know a longer string in order to encrypt a shorter string. So that's what the QROM is doing. And so the uh, ciphertext is M XOR QROM B. And uh, when the key is revealed, in order to decrypt, um, we will um, be able to um, compute um, QROM B and then use the original ciphertext M XOR QROM B and do an XOR and that will reconstruct M. The intuitive security argument is that producing M is equivalent to producing uh, the QROM of Y and that should require full knowledge of Y. I mean, should in quotation marks. Um, and Bob and Charlie can simultaneously produce Y with a probability of most one or a half plus one over two, two to the lambda, that's from the um, monogamy and entanglement game. Formally, we're gonna prove this using a novel simultaneous one-way to hiding lemma. So the one-way to hiding lemma originally proposed by Unruh is one of these techniques to circumvent the QROM um, uh, no cloning issues. And here we have the simultaneous situation where Bob and Charlie need to simultaneously learn a string. So uh, that's why we called it this simultaneous one-way to hiding lemma. And that's where we get this bound from. Um, open questions on the unclonable encryption front would be uh, security of unclonable encryption without this QROM. Um, and uh, to show a indistinguishability based definition. So instead of Bob and Charlie simultaneously asking to guess M for a random M, uh, we, we, we would want to ask that they not both be able to distinguish an encryption of a message M from an encryption of a fixed message. So that's similar to the certified deletion case where we would encrypt based on the bit B, we would encrypt uh, the message or a dummy string zero. So um, ideally we would want this indistinguishability based definition. And that is related to the unclonable bit problem, um, which I find very interesting. So uh, we would want to find a scheme where you encode a, uh, a single bit into a quantum encoding, and then the key is revealed, and then Bob and Charlie give a bit B1 and B2, and we want to find a scheme where the probability that both 
all three bits are equal, uh, tends to a half as n goes towards infinity. I just want to mention uh, a third application, which is unclonable decryption. And um, uh, and we're originally uh, given in terms of unclonable decryption keys, uh, this could also be seen as single decryptor encryption. So it's a way where the uh, decryption key is quantum. It's a public key encryption scheme. The secret key is quantum. That's the one used to decrypt. And the point being that we're going to use the unclonability of the quantum decryption key to guarantee that there's only one person who can ever decrypt. So even if we have a single if we have a single copy of the decryption key, it won't be possible to create two registers, both of which can be used for decryption. And that is one of the uh, applications of uh, unclonable cryptography that's mentioned in this paper that's presented uh, tomorrow. Okay, um, in the last five minutes, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Um, I will tell you about um, the third level of the unclonability hierarchy, which is functionality, right? So we started with um, authentication, like the quantum money. The next level up was information, like unclonable encryption, certified deletion. And there's one level above that, which is functionality, which is software, programs, circuits. These things are useful to run computations. They take an input, they give an output. And the question here is, can we make them unclonable? So for those who remember computer disks, you know, can you take a computer program and code it using quantum information, which prevents from making uh, copies, pirated copies of that computer program? So, and just to say, uh, according to the schedule that I see, you have until 45 after, so there's plenty of time. Oh, okay, questions. maybe that's include, that includes questions. So um, I'll, I'll go through the copy protection and, and leave some time for questions, thanks. Sounds good. Um, so the copy protection was uh, proposed um, uh, initially by Aronson in some early work in 2009, and I would say in the past year to two years, it's kind of it's taken up, uh, become much more um, involved, and there's many more people working on that. What is copy protection? So we have a function we want to encode that into a quantum piece of software. And then we'll have a type of uh, interpreter, a quantum computer that will take the software, take an input X and produce F of X. Note that the F function is the one that was originally coded into this quantum software. And um, here we have a pirate. So uh, a pirate tries to make pirated copies and uh, distribute them to some users. Then we would want to limit the possibility that the users can simultaneously evaluate F, whatever that means. Um, when I started working on this topic, it was really just like, how do you how do you describe having a functionality, and namely that would that would um, also help you describe how to describe not having a functionality. Um, and you'll see that in the definitions that 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 we end up using. Um, we ended up using something like, well, if you have a functionality, then you can win at challenges, which, which correspond to asking questions related to the input output behavior of that functionality. If you don't have the functionality that you can't, then you cannot win at those challenges. Um, and that's, that's because that's coming from like this fact that we, these, these parties may be adversarial. So maybe they're like colluding with the pirate and they, they have like, well, there's different levels. Um, I'll get back to this later. Okay. So, um, the um, some basic observations. First of all, quantum software is reusable to a certain extent. If we have a piece of software that can be used quantumly, suppose that it's uh, relatively correct, then, um, and this is a classical outcome that means, then we can do a coherent copy of that classical outcome, run the quantum uh, interpreter in reverse, and then we will obtain an approximately correct version of the original input. That's why there's a tilde here. Um, by some known uh, lemmas or theorems. So uh, it's important to emphasize that we're talking in, in clonable and copy protection, we're talking about preventing two simultaneous evaluations of the program. Uh, we're not preventing uh, repeated evaluations. 
because that actually cannot be prevented. It's quantum software is, is reusable uh, in general. Um, if we're trying to do copy protection, there are some things that we can't, can't even hope. So if a function is learnable, it means that the pirate can do a polynomial number of queries on this function and learn the, learn the actual function. And then he has a classical description of it and he can share that with Alice and Bob. So these ones cannot be copy protected. If we have perfect correctness, that's eta equals zero in the previous slide, then this cannot be protected, copy protected against unbounded adversaries because the adversary can do this, um, this procedure here multiple times and there will never be any errors. You can get the entire truth table of the uh, function and share that with Alice and Bob. Um, we're going to focus mostly on point functions. Uh, the reason being that this is a very difficult problem. So let's choose a relatively easy uh, family of functions. This one is not learnable. Um, so we're good. And point functions, um, they, um, as their name suggests, they uh, single out a single point here at 0, 1, 0, 1, where the function will evaluate to 1, and otherwise a function evaluates to 0 everywhere else. For the results that we'll be mentioning, uh, they will actually hold for a larger class of functions called compute and compare. Um, I might get to that towards the end of the talk if I have time. So going back to what is copy protection? Okay, so we have this uh, machine and what does it mean to evaluate correctly? So for correctness, we're going to have this um, challenge distribution and um, we will give inputs X to this uh, honest party and he will uh, evaluate the program according to the honest evaluation procedure. And with probability half for a point function, with probability half will give the actual point P and with the uh, remaining probability, We'll give, we'll give uniformly at random one of the other points, P prime. And average correctness means that up to some error term eta, the outcome is correct in expectation over choice of X. Um, we're limited to the average correctness. I'll, come, I'll bring that up uh, shortly. Um, of course, it'd be better to have um, worst case correctness. We're gonna use this nice definition of Colangelo, Magents, and Paramba of what is copy protection. Well, you know, I talked about what does it mean to have a function? Here, uh, the um, Alice and Bob will be receiving challenges from uh, a referee, let's say. For instance, what is f sub p of x1? And Alice gives an answer. And Bob is asked, what is f sub p of x2? And Bob gives an answer. And, and then the referee decides whether that is correct, jointly correct or jointly false. We can have, okay, this is these different levels of users. We could have users that are honest. That means that they follow the honest uh, evaluation procedure. Okay, that's pretty clear. We could have one party being honest and one party being malicious. So this malicious party is colluding with the pirate. It's kind of like, okay, well, Alice and Bob, maybe they, um, they have, uh, they don't, they could be oblivious to the pirating. For instance, they, they have a legitimate set top box and they're trying to, they're trying to watch some, um, some uh, uh, pay TV, it used to be called, I guess. And, uh, but maybe the pirate has, has, copied, has pirated the versions, but they, they're able to watch it on their le legitimate set top box. Here, Bob really, he knows that he's, that, he's, um, that he's trying to cheat the system. He's colluding with the pirate and trying to use a, a fake set top box to be able to read, the, pro to read the, the TV program or the software, let's say. And um, uh, of course you can have also both parties being malicious. Here we'll have this, the, cha the same challenge distribution as for correctness. And we will look at the probability of winning where the winning means that both Alice and Bob output the correct value. And the epsilon security will be that the probability of winning is um, bounded by a half plus epsilon. So a half they could win um, trivially by guessing randomly because of this challenge distribution. And this epsilon is this little allowed fudge factor. Uh, we could generalize to other functions and challenge distributions if we wanted to. The uh, results on quantum copy protection um, starting in 2009, uh, we had all functions that are not learnable using a quantum oracle. Um, and then 2020, all functions that are not learnable using a classical oracle, or an oracle is like a trusted piece of hardware. And um, recently, um, 
using a quantum random oracle, which does not, which uh, crucially does not depend on the um, program. Uh, this was shown for point functions, actually compute and compare. And uh, the work I want to tell you about today, although I'm kind of running out of time, so I'll, I'll just go over it briefly, is how to do point functions for honest malicious of, um, evaluations, and there are no computational assumptions. And um, also some follow-up work is um, how to do copy protection for pseudorandom functions. Uh, there's a related concept called secure software releasing. Here, uh, it's a piece of software that Alice creates, gives it to Bob, and then Bob should have a way to return it, meaning that when it's returned, Alice can check that it's returned and Bob no longer has the power to evaluate that function. Um, so he should not be able to keep a backup pirated copy. And there's a link with honest malicious copy protection and secure software releasing. Namely, uh, we can do this correspondence. The software here is what the pirate gets. And one way of verifying return software is to honestly evaluate it and check that it works. So that's why there's this honest malicious situation here. And the remaining uh, pirated software here could be the, could be the, the piece that the uh, pirate keeps as a backup copy. So, um, uh, what we showed is that um, honest malicious copy protection implies secure software releasing. So if we're able to establish honest malicious copy protection, then, then we'll automatically have software releasing schemes. Um, so this is uh, there initially soft, secure software releasing was proposed by Nathan Laplaca um, with this type of construction. And there was uh, quite a bit of follow-up work on secure software releasing. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over this compute and compare. Um, it's it's a result of, of CMP20 who show, that show how to go from uh, point functions to compute and compare. So to achieve honest malicious copy protection, this is the box that we're trying to do here. Uh, we're going to do that using quantum total authentication. And that will imply this secure soft releasing by the uh, lemma that I just mentioned. Um, it was kind of an interesting thing to link uh, message authentication to uh, uh, copy protection. In message authentication, we have a message and we want to be able to detect if there's a pirate on the channel modifying the message. So uh, that's how this uh, Bob can verify, it's a private key scheme. Bob can verify that the message has been modified. And there's this uh, quantum total authentication is an upgrade to the, to the regular definition of authentication that shows that the pirate, upon acceptance here of Bob, the pirate here uh, knows nothing related to the message or to the key. So that's really useful because we can dissociate um, upon acceptance, we can say that the pirate has nothing left remaining uh, that, that, that's part of this actual scheme, the, nothing related to the message or to the key. And it's realized by two designs and the strong trap code. So to get copy protection from quantum total authentication, we're going to link the point P to the key in the authentication. So that's this link between the point and the uh, authentication scheme. So the authentication scheme is gonna be auth to encode and birth to decode. And we're gonna use a fixed dummy state. I mean, it could be anything here. So this message itself is not important. It's the key that's mapped to the point. And um, to, to uh, protect, we will authenticate using the point P, this dummy state. To evaluate, we should verify using the candidate point Q. And we'll accept if the verification accepts. I'll put one if the verification accepts. And the correctness uh, is kind of cute. It's like, well, uh, if you're using the same point P to, um, to check the authentication, then that should accept the probability one. And if you use the wrong point for the probability, uh, namely uh, a Q, which is different from P, by the properties of the, of the authentication scheme, there's a high chance of, of rejecting. And that's how we get this average correctness, unfortunately, because of this expectation. Um, for security, we use the property of the, of the total authentication, namely that, remember, the, the pirate has no, no information left upon accept the part has no information left on the um, on the uh, key or on the message. So um, 
you know, a condition on, condition on acceptance, the attacker knows essentially nothing on the key. So uh, we use the properties of that total authentication and we're able to bound the probability. So supposing that um, the first evaluator accepts we can bound the we can bound the um, probability that the second evaluator is able to distinguish uh, the message. So that's the that's the chain of results that we have. Authentication implies honest malicious copy protection implies the secure soft releasing. Um, there are lots of questions on quantum unclonability. Um, I've already mentioned some for uh, encoding of quantum information and clonable encryption. Um, we could look at to into unconditional security for copy protection. So we could ask for two malicious evaluators. I, I don't I don't see any fundamental reason why this would not work. We just we just did not have the proof techniques to do this. So right now it was uh, honest malicious evaluation, but I think it should be secure against two evaluators. And what if multiple copies of the program are out there like that? That would be a reasonable situation where there are maybe a constant number or a polynomial number of, of program copies. Could we still have copy protection in that case? And uh, we could ask to go beyond compute and compare functions. And uh, another question that I haven't really touched uh, that much would be the foundations of unclonability. Um, we've seen different embodiments, but is there a way to talk about it abstractly? What is it? And maybe even a simple primitive. So uh, this, this happens in um, multi-party computation where oblivious transfer, bit commitment um, are, are simple, uh, simple primitives. And from those, we can build larger cryptographic primitives. So one question is that, is, is there such a simple primitive for unclonability from which we could build uh, many or most of the schemes that we talked about today and beyond? And another um, relevant topic would be to have NISC era unclonable schemes, NISC noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. So schemes that are ready to be implemented now. So they need to be uh, natively fault tolerant, um, noise tolerant, the, and preferably also with current technology. So uh, the gold standard for that would be something like prepare and measure and uh, like technology that's already developed for quantum key distribution, for instance, would be, um, would be nice to be able to have these schemes uh, being able to be adapted to that, to that existing technology. So with that, I wanted to uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for a fantastic tutorial. So, um, so for questions, uh, feel free to put your question into Slack or simply raise your hand on, on Zoom. And while people are preparing their questions, let me ask some. This gives me an opportunity. So, um, so actually, so at the, at the very beginning, you had um, kind of two categories of, of, you know, sort of ways to feel about no cloning. One was to sort of be excited because it enables, you know, QKD and these, and these other things. And the other is, you know, to, to sort of be depressed. Be, and and if, I, if I remember right, the, the things in the, in the list of reasons to be depressed about were mostly, um, sort of proof obstacles, you know, like things that make it hard, like like rewinding and Oracle queries and so on. And I'm just wondering, I mean, do you think that there's there's maybe kind of a third category or, or, or maybe a, a second category of reasons to be depressed about no cloning, which is, you know, um, th things where situations where, where no cloning also prevents um, honest users from, from uh, doing something interesting, you know, some cryptographic thing. Um, so, so, so for example, I'm thinking of like, um, you know, the 2002 paper, uh, authentication paper saying that, um, um, you know, one pointing out that one thing, you know, we can't do because of no cloning is we can't take a quantum state, you know, make a copy of it and then provide both the state and some, you know, some signed, some signature of that state. Yeah, um, great. I, I, I should have added that, added that one of yours in, in my list. I think I would have put it in the, the depressed side. Right. Um, and, then, and then the related work who act, that actually recently showed that, um, well, that, that, that pessimist point of view was not the complete picture, that if you, you look at it carefully, uh, work at it hard enough, then there, there are ways to um, sign quantum states as long as they're encrypted. If I'm not mistaken, that was that was the 
take home message of that of that work. So um, yeah, I should add that one. I would. I don't think it's a third category. I think it it would have been like the pessimist point of view, and then I don't have any examples where the pessimist wins. Like I don't have any examples where it's actually not possible, and you just not possible to use to to emulate the classical world uh, using quantum information. It's just usually a matter of hard work. I see. Um, so uh, so another question. So some people are typing, but let me, I think maybe I can squeeze one in. So um, for so maybe this is a this is a quick one. So you you mentioned NISC capable schemes at the end. So, you know, so one of these schemes that you described, um, you know, basically uses BB84 states. So can you just say a, a little bit about why, why it's not actually oh, okay. yeah. already so I, NISC I, capable? I, I could have been more precise that the certified deletion is, according to my standards, uh, NISC ready. Um, I think you're really, you're referring to that one because it uses prepared measure, conjugate coding states, noise tolerant, uh, basically using the same technology as quantum key distribution, except maybe, you know, uh, memory is often a, a, an issue um, in these in these schemes. Usually you usually you picture that something is stored, eventually the key is leaked, but that storage, does that mean it has to be quantum? Um, so we are we're very we're at the very beginnings of quantum memories if you if you want to go to the full scale applications of these but you could still consider uh, what it would mean uh, for like short term memory um, I, I could, it could still be meaningful so that a certified deletion is definitely ready um, but the other ones uh, copy protected programs no like they're way out um, and uh, secure soft releasing same thing um, uh, unclonable encryption. It could be getting closer. It's not noise tolerant yet, but uh, at the base, at the basis, it's it's uh, conjugate coding. So there, I think there's hope. Um, so I think maybe there's a question. Car Carolina, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Um, yeah, yeah. I hope it's it's not too simple. But um, so when you were talking about the quantum software, you said that it would be possible to sort of run it in reverse to in to ideally reobtain the perfect quantum state but um how does this work since i mean the the principle for the for quantum messages would be that that's not possible you can't reobtain the quantum state after measuring it so how does it work with the quantum software okay thanks for that question um the quantum software i see it as a series of quantum gates so it has a quantum input which was in the picture maybe i could get that slide back um, it has uh, an input, uh, but the, the computation itself is a quantum circuit. So um, quantum circuits can be, without loss of generality, written uh, as circuits that do not do any measurements. So you can purify them and uh, don't, you simply do not measure. Um, I should have said that. And uh, when you purify a circuit, um, so you write it from left to right and you have a bunch of gates and running it in reverse means running the circuit in reverse, meaning starting at the end and then doing the gates from left to right. Um, and that is, uh, that's, that's the description of this, of this computer here. So in terms of the, and the point is that there, there's no quantum, um, this is a, this is a this is a, these are circuits only. The quantum data itself is taken as an input. And um, that's what allows you to run the circuit in the other direction. And then the output will be uh, an almost perfect copy of the original input here. And I guess here it's important that this, this measurement succeeds and produces the desired output with very high probability. Exactly. So this needs to be, uh, you know, this this correctness, um, just how correct it is, is related to eta, and that's going to affect the um, the closeness of the final output to the to the initial input. So if eta is zero and perfectly correct, then this will be perfect, and otherwise, then there's a trade off. Oh, thank you. I think I get the difference now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. Okay, and F Philippe, did you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, so my question is, um, so most of the, um, 
application that you presented us and our no cloning or is in the information theoretic setting uh, where you have uh, uh, security against unbounded uh, series. Uh, my question is, um, so if you combine no cloning with some sort of computational assumption, you can get uh, so-called uh, one-shot or one-time primitives such as quantum lightning, uh, one-shot signatures, um, which have uh, based on the work of Zendry. Um, do you see you see that there could be uh, the sort of same hierarchy of uh, authentication, information, and functionality uh, in this sort of one-shot setting where you can envision maybe like a, a program that you sample and that, that you can only run once or, or something of that sort. Okay, um, I'm not so familiar with the one shot as, as you describe it. Uh, it's not possible to have quantum one-time programs without a hardware assumption uh, because of this rewinding uh, picture in the question that I just answered. Um, um, but there's something, okay, if you can enforce that something needs to be classical, like in tokenized signature schemes, you can you can say, well, look, the signature is classical. That means that somebody measured, and then you have a hope, I guess, for for really like one-time use type of things. And I guess that's that's the problem with the one-time programs. You can't you can't enforce that. Um, so um, of course, I like I like the idea of combining information theory with computational, and many of this related works, uh, if you can still see my slides, do that. You know. Um, uh, Namely, uh, there's a lot of that in, in the second reference here, Aronson, Liu, Liu, Zandri, and Zhang. So I, I didn't mean for the hierarchy to be only information theoretic. And um, yeah, maybe maybe there's another, another type of one-shot version of this that can be nice to look at. All right, thanks. Any other questions for my sheep? So let me ask one more because I don't see any hands right now. Um, so for certified deletion and um, unclonable encryption, so you described these sort of security games, which kind of are, some, are meant to, as far as I understand, kind of capture these two properties. Um, and I'm wondering, um, uh, let's say for the case of unclonable encryption, do those do those security properties um, imply secrecy, or do you also have to ask for secrecy um, oh. separately? Yeah, good point. Uh, certified deletion, we we defined it separately, and that may, in hindsight, may have been a mis not a mistake, but an oversight. Like it could be possible mm -hmm. to kind of incorporate it into the same game. And uh, unclonable encryption, I think it's built in because uh, if you could, uh, if it weren't secure, if it, like if you could you know, decrypt without the key, then then the pirate could do that and give copies to the to the Alice and Bob. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I should have said that for certified deletion that um, as it, as it is as is I presented it, you'd have to have a separate definition, but um, that could be built in. Does it make sense to think about sort of composable definitions for all this so that all these things are kind of packaged for sure? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and there, there is follow-up work, as I cited, uh, on okay. composable certified deletion um, Great. or unclonable encryption. I don't think that's been done. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, of course, that's always nice to have. Okay, then um, oh, we do have a question. Xiao Qing, you wanna, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the uh, tutorial, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, like my question is, I, I remember that you mentioned there are two criteria for um, the copy protection. Like if one is the function, uh, if it's uh, learnable, then it cannot be protected. And the second one is the correctness of the function. Like if the output is 100% correct, then it cannot be protected as well, right? So my question is, um, 
uh, would this like the the second criteria would 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 it stop uh, like stop people from uh, improving the correctness of the function? Because I mean, like for a function, we want we want it to be as correct as possible. But like if it's one hundred percent correct the output, then it cannot be quantum protected. Like I find it's kind of like there is kind of a trade off between the correctness and and the protection. Yes, that's a very insightful uh, comment. Thanks for that. Um, this comment is, a, uh, if you can see the slide, that's where I mentioned it. It's about the unbounded adversaries. And uh, indeed, um, I was super surprised that we managed to get unbounded security against unbounded adversaries for copy protection because I had this impossibility in mind. It's like, it's not possible because if it's perfectly correct, you can always uh, get get the uh, circuit by uh, this, this uh, uh, basically gentle measurement. I didn't mention the name, but that, that rewinding idea. Um, so uh, if you're trying to go for unbounded security, you need to have uh, imperfect correctness. And uh, it's a trade-off, but I think that could be a trade-off that you're willing to, to, to make uh, to get uh, information theoretic security. Um, and it's not that much of a trade-off. Like um, for point functions, it's just like from time to time, you need to have a negligible success probably, neg negligible error that will uh, prevent this brute force attack. It's a brute force attack. If you're trying to go back and forth, back and forth and getting the entire truth table and finding the point. Um, for the computational setting, this is not a limitation. So I would encourage for the computational setting to try to go for perfect correctness and uh, you could still get uh, security, I don't see any contradiction there. Thank you. Thanks for the answer. Okay, great. Um, if there are, there appear to be no further questions. So let's uh, all thank Anne in whatever way we can for a wonderful tutorial. And um, yeah, take care, everyone. <laughs>